the truth is I'm scared probably a lot more often than people think, um, which is always good because that usually means like if you're not scared, you're usually probably not looking at things the right way. So by being scared, I know that I'm, I'm looking at it uh, logically like, okay, there's something that could go wrong here, but I've accepted that and I feel, I trust myself enough that I'm going to be able to hit whatever line or race or whatever it is. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about. Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. First off, Dane, thanks so much for joining me and stoked to have you here on the show. Yeah, yeah, that's an honor. I've a uh, big fan. Been listening for a long time. <laughs> I doubt that, but either way, I'm stoked. Um, Dane, so you're what, like 27 now, I think is what we were talking about last night. Um, you've lived like quite the life. Uh, you've, you know, traveled around the world since you were pretty young. Uh, you've got, you know, an Olympian and four-time world champion as a father. You've got a whole family of world champions. And you're one of the top paddlers in the sport of kayaking. You've won almost every, you know, event out there, at least in the in the whitewater disciplines, uh, within freestyle extreme racing and stuff like that. You've done some cool hundred foot waterfalls. Um, kind of tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So basically, uh, obviously I was in a very fortunate, uh, position Even when I first came around, my dad was already a pro kayaker and Olympian world champion, um, as well as just kayaking was his full-time pursuit essentially. And so, Immediately, uh, I was already surrounded by the sport, but also right away from a young age, able to go to a lot of incredible places. Even if I wasn't kayaking, I get to watch my dad kayak or be surrounded by the river. Um, and obviously doing that with your wife, Emily, and my sister. So we got to travel together and be in these incredible spots. Um, so immediately it was like kayaking was going to be my pursuit. I love watching it. I love watching videos. I love playing with foam boats in the river um, as well as watching my dad and all these people um, compete and paddle. And then from that, I was able to get into kayaking really early. Like my grandma first river, um, when I was about two years old, I think little falls or whatever it's called in, in DC. Um, and for any chance I could get to be in a boat, uh, I would take that opportunity, whether it's dealing people's kayaks at the side of the river and the auto or whatever it was. Um, but pretty much from once my dad finally, once we finally learned how to roll, uh, once, like, I didn't learn how to roll until I was eight. Maybe my dad would just flip me back up if I ever flipped over. Once I learned how to roll when I was about eight years old, along with my sister, it pretty much just took off from there. And from there, all I wanted to do was spend all day on the water if I could. And if my dad would take me, I would go. And when he couldn't take me, I'd still try to find a way to be around the river. So, yeah, I was in a very fortunate opportunity from the beginning. And from there, I've been able to just kayak all the time year round. That's amazing. So you, you talk about when you, you know, learn how to kayak when you were a kid, your dad would just take you river running and you didn't know how to roll and he would just flip you up. Did, were you like ever just like, you know, scared of flipping over or did you just have like full confidence in your dad? You're like, oh, if I flip, no worries. Dad's just going to roll me back up. Like, was it scary? Uh, from what I remember, I mean, it's not like we were running the hardest stuff. Um, but at the same time, and there were times where like we would run the river, he'd hold on to me when we were running the rapid. Um, but I mean, in the end, uh, I think I was probably just enjoying myself so much or I wasn't even that aware. I just kind of like, yeah, if I flip over, my dad's going to get me. And it's a lot of pressure on him. But I mean, I, uh, I mean I'd be super nervous trying to do that with a, a kid all the time. I can't imagine what it'd be like. But I mean, uh, in the end, I mean, he was always there to roll it up. I think there was, I, Emily had one experience where it took him a long time to get to, but uh, um, on the Ottawa, it's just a situation, but like, I don't know if I ever had a time where it was like took too long. And I'm sure if there was a time that that did happen, maybe would have been a little scarred, but it never happened. So, um, and obviously things got a little more simple once I learned how to roll. But I think, I don't even think I, I think my first time pulling my skirt and swimming, I was only like maybe like nine or 10 or 11. So like, uh, and from there it's just gone terribly wrong. Now I've swam a lot more. Um, uh, but no, I think, uh, I don't remember it being that scary, but I think I was just enjoying myself. That's cool. So when you, when you were learning to roll, I'm, I, I kind of know this story because, you know, I've spent enough time with you and Emily, but, but I want to hear your version of it. Who decided that they wanted to roll and who followed suit? Because both you and Emily like didn't want to roll. And then like in one day you both decided to, and then learn how to roll together the same day. Who's like, whose idea really was it? I, I originally thought that I wanted to do it first, but then Emily got the first one. But I, it sounds like so basically what happened is that Emily finally decided that she wanted to learn how to roll. My dad was stoked. 
Um, she was, uh, I guess she would have been like 11 at the time, but I guess she decided she wanted to learn how to roll. Uh, and so he took us down and started teaching us together at the same time. Emily got, um, got first and we basically learned right around the same time. And we both also got our first combat roles right around the same time, like a, like sometime in that a few day period, I think at Wasa. Um, but it seems like from all accounts, it sounds like Emily was like, okay, I want to learn how to roll. And then it was like, all right, well, I guess I'll learn with him. So go with her. So yeah, I'll, I'll give her the credit on that one. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, 2020 has been a bit of a crazy year. And earlier this year, for anybody, those like out there listening that don't know, Dane and I live pretty much beside each other and spend a fair amount of time uh, with each other. And so earlier this year, you you were telling me that you were worried, you know, that with COVID, that like at the end of the season, you're like, oh man, I'm not really going to have anything to show for it. And I was thinking in my head, well, like, okay. So last year you, you won the world championships in freestyle. You won the world championships in extreme racing. You then went to Pakistan and ran arguably like one of the biggest rapids ever, Malupe. Um, then you went over to Chile and ran the second highest waterfall ever. Then to Indonesia, or I guess Hawaii ran a whole bunch of hundred footers. Then to Indonesia ran a couple more massive waterfalls. And then you're like, oh man, I'm just not going to have anything to show for my year. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I think you're okay, bud. Like, I mean, I know that, that, you know, 2020 has been, you know, a shakeup for everybody, but how was like in the end, how was it for you? What were you able to do? I mean, it's still to me anyway, it looks like it was just an incredible year for you. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, uh, I mean, there were, there were more things to, there were more things that can happen for the, during 2020 than just maybe not being able to travel or kayak as much like that. Uh, we were still, uh, at least for myself in a very fortunate position with the whole thing to still have one. I got all my projects out of the way, but right before it, um, started uh, right before lockdown started. So I was fortunate that like, um, I didn't have any plans that necessarily changed like projects to cancel or anything like that. And I know there were a lot of people that weren't as fortunate when it came to that. Um, but the good news was is that one, we were able to be in Tennessee, still kayak a lot, get a lot of content. But even if I didn't kayak from March on, I still like that winter alone was a two years worth of things in a one. Like, like I said, I went to Pakistan and I went to Hawaii, I got to do first year, a bunch of stuff. And I got to do Malay and Chile, which was, uh, the drop I always wanted to do. And then I also got to surf in between some yachts. And then I went to Indonesia. That trip wasn't as much of a success, but I got everything done right before lockdown. And then 2020 still been a great year. It's like still spent a few months. We spent like four months in quarantine on a ranch, obviously. And then uh, even now, I'm still trying to be super safe about where I go, who I hang out with and things like that. But I've, I've kind of eased back into doing a little bit more like hiking on North Carolina for a few months and stuff. Um, but it's still been an amazing year. And in the end, I'm got no complaints or worse position to be in. So pretty fortunate. That's amazing. So, uh, in talking about, you know, Malupe and in Pakistan, Malupa, uh, Malupa. Malupa. Okay. I'm saying that wrong. And talk about Malupa in Pakistan and Salto de, de, de Malay. Malay. How do you say Malay. it? You, you're never good with Spanish. Uh, I was never good with Spanish. Uh, Rafa yeah. would attest to that. Okay. So you ran essentially arguably one of the biggest rapids in the world and the second highest waterfall how did they compare to each other and would you do them again which one was you know which one would you not do anything like that or they're both just different and you can't wait to go back to both uh well they're definitely really scary um i think i don't know which one was probably more i was really fired up for both i guess so it's really hard to i think i was probably less scared there than a lot of places like i was scared but like uh I feel like I'm more scared running something that's like, oh man, I have to run. Like if I run an 80 footer, I've done a few times. It's kind of like, oh, like I'm excited, but I'm also like, oh, but I've already done this a few times. I don't know if I want to like, if I keep pushing myself on it, but like Lupa, when we got there and I, it took me like five minutes to be like, not even like I basically showed up and it was just like, oh, okay, well this looks great. Um, Cause the line was there with the, I think the water was a little lower, but the line was there. I saw it almost immediately. I was like, okay, sweet. So I was super fired up. Cause I had been super, I almost said no to going to Pakistan because I had a pretty strong feeling I was going to want to run Malupa or at least go there with the idea, like, I'm probably going to see it and be like, all right, because I don't portage that much these days. Um, or I don't get to, it's very rarely I get to something and I'm like, I can't at least see a way to do it or a line that's possible. So I, uh, I almost said no to Pakistan for, for that kind of that reason alone. I was just like, I think I'll probably want to run Malupa. And that type of big water isn't always my favorite thing to do. But 
obviously getting there, I was just so fired up that it was it was going to be possible and do it. And I felt really good about the line. So I was just super fired up on it. Um, but then going to to one, well, the biggest thing about Malay was that I did it after like a month in Hawaii, um, where I did another hundred footer out there as well as a few other big waterfalls. So I was already like feeling really confident with waterfalls. Whereas if I come off like six months, no waterfalls, maybe I would have been less confident. Um, but then after so long doing some good stuff in Hawaii, then going to, to Chile, the line just looks so good. It was definitely a really rowdy waterfall because it was like super fast, super narrow, and it wasn't a very wide lip. So it was one of those drops that some weird stuff could definitely happen. And the boil was absolutely colossal. Um, I would love to run Malay again just because I, my skirt blew. I, I stayed in my boat when I came out of the boil, but then I was just basically in the boils right after just with a boat full of water with no paddle. It's like not much you can do at that point. So I basically just got out right onto the rock. Um, so it wasn't the most perfect line I could have had. It wasn't hundred percent successful, but I was super soft. The line was good. Um, so both of them, it's maybe if I got there, I'd be like, well, maybe I want to do it again. I think I'd run Malupa before Malay again. Um, cause waterfalls are waterfalls. I don't think I could ever have a better line than I had on Malay. Like even if I stayed in my boat, like the line itself, is going to be a huge roll of the dice with that drop. Whereas Malupa is still a bit of a roll of the dice, but as long as the levels are about the same, maybe a little higher, it should, uh, I could see running it again. But that being said, that, that map is huge. How was the impact on Malay? It was super soft because I thought it was going to be like the most colossal hit because I wasn't going to get like swallowed by the drop. The boils were like 15 feet tall because it was just that like cauldron of where the water has been hitting for so long. It's just a, basically a, just a cave, just vertical cave. It's just two cauldron. So all the water wasn't like spreading out in this big pool. It was just coming straight back up on a pretty high volume drop. So those boils were like 10 to 15 feet tall. Um, wow. Caleb definitely, when we were on the radio, when he finally got to the bottom, he was like, the boils are massive. So I expected probably I expect an absolute train wreck of a hit but luckily um I think I had the perfect angle and it kept me in the flow a little more than I expected and it was it was super soft but I went super deep that's awesome you're just as in tune with the sport as anybody where do you see the sport kind of evolving to do you think there's going to be like higher and higher waterfalls that are continued to push do you think we're going to get you know start pushing bigger and bigger volume rapids or do you see the freestyle like you guys like you and Annie Ol doing the Cobra flips and, and Tennessee Tomahawks and all this stuff, like, or maybe even Creek racing freestyle. Like where do you see the most room for growth within whitewater kayaking as a, as a whole? I think everything, every, everywhere has its lane and things that can be done. I think the, everything is progressing. Each part of the sport is progressing in its own way. And I think gets stepped, stepped up, whether it's running bigger water, bigger waterfall, like obviously people are going to like, there's going to, be an attempt sometime soon, I'm sure, for a, a to break the world uh, waterfall record. Um, people are starting to learn how to do a lot more controlled stuff off of waterfalls, which I think, one, it's exciting because we're definitely it's starting to make us realize that there is a, actually a little bit of, as long as you can figure out the technique, there is a little more control than we thought to throw flips off of waterfalls, which might open up doors to get a little more crazy off of drops we've been doing a long time, as well as um, really start bringing competitions in on that aspect. Um, when it comes to racing, all of that, I think in the end, everything is getting stepped up in its own way. Um, but I think what's really going to, I think the next step is just really we need to start having more events, more crossover events, more events, just pushing the sport, getting it to bigger audiences. Um, and put, that would also allow the room for people to improve. Kind of like how like X Games, now I could be wrong, but it seems to me like, like I know to watch the X Games like for snowboarding or uh, dirt biking, whatever it is. Cause I know that a lot of times people they like, practice into the airbag all the time. That's where they're trying to bust out something new or rebel rampage or something like that. I think while we're progressing and it's been really good on our own, I think it'd be really cool to have competition that would encourage people to try to step it up, do something new, whether it's a double Cobra flip or it's a double free wheel and control or whatever it is. So I think, um, uh, I think as things progress, hopefully we'll have competition that will come in line with that to encourage people to start learning new techniques and things like that. Almost like a, a next generation of the Ray Del Rio event of the waterfall freestyle competition down in Mexico. Something like that yeah. might be uh, in the near future. No, I, I think that would be super cool and also something that I'd love to see. And it would obviously be, you know, extremely visually impressive. Um, I think I'd like to compete, but it's hard. I mean, you guys throw stuff. I go paddling with you all the time and I'm like, Oh gosh, I can't believe you're throwing that Cobra flip or Tomahawk or whatever right there because you have a different 
like eye for things than I do at, at this point in time where I'm like, dude, it looks like you're going to pee on your brains out. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to try to pee on that rock and Cobra flip off of it. And I'm like, I, huh, that's, it's not what I was thinking. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so much, just yeah. where you're going with the freestyle is super cool to see. And any old too, I mean, just shout out to him too, because, um, yeah, it's just, oh, yeah. it's, it's rad to see what you guys are up to. So you also just won the green race and you broke your, you know, previous record. So the record's now at 402. I know you've been pushing for sub four along with some other, some other racers as well. Um, but you've definitely made some, you know, huge ground there. And, and it was pretty impressive to see that you were, I think 13 seconds faster than, than second place. So you definitely like ahead of the field. What do you consider harder between winning an event like the Green Race, uh, the Freestyle Worlds last year, or uh, the North Fork Championships? Uh, are they all kind of just very different, or which one do you feel you have to train for more? Uh, it's hard because, I, like, like you said, they're all different. I guess the hardest part is that um, it's hard to say which one people train for different – depends on the event. Some people don't train for certain events. Some people train a lot for certain events. It depends on – like there are more people training for like really training for like something like freestyle versus green race. There are people that train, but not probably quite at the same way as someone like training for like freestyle world would. Um, it really just depends on the type of race. Uh, I think the, they're all really hard in their own way. Like green race. Um, it's always a huge shuffle because some people just have a smooth run, but don't paddle as hard, but they still end up pretty high or some people try to paddle really hard and eating it then maybe they could have had really good time so like green race is like a lot more there's a lot more rolling the dice when it comes to because with a long boat right, running something like that it's like you can do the same thing twice and something could go very different and the snowball effect is insanely savage out there because in a long boat and you're trying to go fast it's so easy like once one little thing gets messed up the whole process everything just starts to fall apart um and with a long boat on the green if you end up going wrong somewhere you usually end up going pretty wrong not like just a little swerve you end up falling into the wrong spot flipping backwards all that fun stuff um so that's the thing about green race is that it's like it's very hard top to bottom four minutes to just keep the boat going exactly where you need it to be because it's a lot different than racing a short boat so like racing a short boat at the north fork i would say that's it's really really hard to win the north fork because it's like there everybody anybody can win on it any day but also um there's a lot of huge features that you have to deal with that again just it's hard to know if they're going to do the same thing back and forth um the biggest thing for me for north fork i find it a little more i would say it feels easier dropping into north fork than something like green rate because north fork especially the short boat like i practice the rapids so much that it's just realistically it's up to me to nail the line like to hit that booth or not get lazy and do it which is similar to green rate but north fork i feel more like feels a little more predictable. I'm like, okay, if I go here, I'm going to be able to, to nail it. Um, but again, it's really hard to keep everything. It's just such big water. Um, but then you do something like freestyle worlds, everybody in the end, you're probably at a similar level, about five or six other people um, training a lot of similar moves, have, getting similar scores. And uh, especially these days, you have to basically be moving the entire ride that if you slip one slip up, one flush, one one pass missed is the difference between winning and losing. Um, so I would say freestyle is one of the harder ones because it's like, especially these days with how many people are so good, it's just a lot to put together every time. And sometimes you nail it, sometimes you flush. It's, uh, it's a lot of pressure, not a lot, a whole lot of room for error, but they're all just so different. They all have their challenges and there's certain people that are really good at one aspect, aren't as good at another. So it just kind of depends on the day and who you're competing against, but they're all fun. That's cool. No, I mean, I, I totally agree that they all have their, their own challenges, uh, and they're all, you know, very difficult in their own ways. Um, I definitely agree that the green race, especially in the long boat category is, is extremely challenging just because it's a boat that, uh, the two of us anyway, don't paddle very often so much so that I don't race long boat anymore. I just, <laughs> I just race short boat cause it's more fun for me. Uh, and I'm in way better control. But I definitely agree that a long boat is, is hard to control out there. How yeah, it's less how... of you in control. Like the boat's almost like like you can try to be in the right spot, but sometimes the boat's just going to do what it does. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree 100%. How do you um, manage like your mindset or how does your mindset change in the different competitions or almost in, in the different aspects of the sport? Like whether it's freestyle versus um, racing versus just like, you know, big volume rapids or, or waterfall creek boating? 
like mindset of like like what it is like what it feels like to to be doing it or like what i think about yeah like how, how how are you managing fear between the different scenarios i mean obviously any day on the water unless it's class two I'm pretty much nervous whatever you're doing there's always something i'm probably doing that i feel a little nervous about or um and especially once you get, get into like bigger competition bigger waterfalls scary rapids i mean i'm always scared people always assume that i'm not but the truth is i'm scared probably a lot more often than people think um, which is always good because that usually means like if you're not scared, you're usually probably not looking at things the right way. So by being scared, I know that I'm I'm looking at it uh, logically, like okay, there's something that could go wrong here, but I've accepted that and I feel I trust myself enough that I'm going to be able to hit whatever line or race or whatever it is. Um, but the easiest way to deal with that, I always find, is just uh, just one feel confident, like only do it if you're like 100% confident that you have the skill. But also, I try to make sure that everything. Uh, the build up to a waterfall or rapid or a competition, everything is as enjoyable as the idea of uh, successfully doing whatever I'm trying to do. So when it's scouting the waterfall, when it's leading up to the competition, I'm making sure I'm having as much fun as possible, whether talking to people, jumping around, smiling, staying stoked, because the more fun I'm having on the way up to the build up to that moment, um, it just makes it that much better when it goes well, but it also just kind of makes the whole experience better for even if the rapid doesn't go well, I mean, I still looked at the wrist, I accepted the wrist, and if it doesn't go well, the whole thing was still worth it because it's like I still I did everything right. I had fun with all the people I was with. I was enjoying myself because it's, what it's fun, it's fun, and what I love to do. So if I'm not enjoying myself through the whole thing, like what's the point? Like the only – it shouldn't just be the, the win that's the only way to stay happy or else like if you lose, if you're not having fun leading up to the moment and then you lose, it just makes it – that much more miserable but also you're just like well why am i doing this if i'm not enjoying myself at any point um which is why it's really easy for people to get burned out so for me i just make everything as fun as possible hanging out with people competition getting fired up above waterfalls just getting stoked whatever it is so that way the whole experience is, is worth it no matter what happens i i love that mentality because it really is true that as long as you're making the whole experience fun one, you're less worried about the outcome because you've already had fun the whole time, right? And so now obviously if you're running, you know, a big waterfall or, or something risky in the sense of like, you know, injury or, or life-threatening, you obviously want good outcome for, for that sake. Um, right. But besides that, uh, you're really just like, oh, I'm having a great time. It's already a win for me because I've had so much fun type thing. That's a really cool mentality and, and I like that a lot. I, I also find it interesting that you say you're you're nervous most of the time because I paddle with you a fair amount and I'm nervous with you a lot um, because you just run a lot of hard white water and and when I'm with you I'm regularly I'm like hey I'm just gonna I trust you I'll just like follow behind you but I'm nervous the whole time so uh, <laughs> I don't know if that makes me more conf uh, confident or comfortable that you're also nervous or if I felt better feeling like, Oh, Dane just has this no problem. I'll just follow him. <laughs> uh. yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's all your strength. No, it's, it's, uh, I mean like tomahawks and things like that or, or free wheels, whatever it is. I'm still nervous, but uh, I feel good about myself. <laughs> That's cool. And so earlier you were also talking about how you think, you know, the waterfall record will get broken at some point in the near future by someone. Is that even like, you've got the second highest waterfall now, is you know trying to attempt for a world record or doing Palouse or anything like that is that even like on your radar or are you just like happy with Malay? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna keep running big drops and I'll definitely want to run a few more like hundred footers. But um, I mean, the big problem is I mean Malay is only 135 or whatever 134. Uh, Palouse is 186. So the step up from that, the hardest part there are per there are good drops out there, but Palouse is I don't think you could design a waterfall more perfect than Palouse um, is the tricky part. I think the attempt will be made sometime in the near future. Um, but the waterfall, I'm sure there's one out there, but the problem is that the ones that are out there that we've seen, the lifts and the, um, the waterfall itself just isn't as clean as Palouse. And once you start dealing with, you know, 190, 200 foot waterfall, 215, that's a lot of time to be trying to set your angle. And a lot of these waterfalls don't have the greatest lift. Um, they're usually like pretty flat to vert. So that's a lot of things that can change. And the biggest problem is that uh, those sides of the waterfalls, if you're not swallowed, that is like, I don't even want to know what that impact would be if you don't get swallowed by the flow running it. Um, so there's a lot of variables that are going to make it tricky to find that drop. It's out there. It'll be done. It'll be attempted. But it's uh, 
Palouse is just really perfect. And I, I've wanted, every now and then I'm like, I think I want to run Palouse, but then I'm usually just kind of like, well, like it's just, you paddle out of flat water, you kind of set your angle, but the waterfall pretty much does all the work. And then hope for the best, but it, it does look like a lot of fun. Anyone that's done it is super badass. I think it's super cool. Uh, but I think if I'm going to push myself, I think I'd rather save myself for something else that comes up um, rather than being the sixth person to run it. I'd rather save myself because there's only so many huge waterfalls that you can roll the dice on. Now, you know, the, the risk is there. The risk is always there. Waterfalls are probably, probably the most dangerous aspect, not like one of the most dangerous aspects of kayaking to pursue. So um, I think I would probably save myself for, for maybe some other drop I find. Um, like I'm not saying I'm looking for a 200 footer right now, but usually I just kind of, if something comes up and I feel really good, I'm just like, well, all right. But I don't think I'm going to try to go for the world record. <laughs> it sounds like your, your Tinder profile. You're like, I'm not really like looking for a girlfriend, but if a girl happens to wander by, if this 200 waterfall, you know, like if somebody sends me one, I'm not going to like turn it off, like turn it down. Like I'll probably go for it either way. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect analogy. <laughs> <laughs> like after doing everything that you've already done, which I mean, you're still super young, or at least I consider you super young, probably because you're younger than me. Um, yeah, yeah. And you, you've achieved so much. What's kind of next for you? Like, is it waterfalls? Is it rapids? Is it events? Is it, are you going to kind of go more into like expedition style? Like, what do you kind of see happening for you in the next, you know, three, five, ten 10 years? Um, I think the, the biggest pursuit for, the near future, I'm going to keep doing it all, but the pursuit will definitely be more towards uh, waterfalls and expeditions um, while still training as much as I need to to do well and everything else, but probably leaning more towards um, doing the more vertical stuff over the next and expeditions, exploring. And because big waterfalls, I know I'm not going to want to do forever. Um, like at some point, I'm going to either just not like be over the risk of getting hurt, but also just, you know, there's like I'm not going to run hundred footers forever. So I'd rather while I feel at my peak uh, for being able to run waterfalls safely and have the best lines possible. Um, I still continue to learn, but as I keep running more, I keep getting better and better. Um, and these next few years are the, are the years I feel I'm going to be at the like, best potential to be able to run more hundred footers and first ascents, uh, first ascent waterfalls, wherever it is, whether it's Indonesia, Russia, whatever it is. Um, so I think big waterfalls are kind of going to be the, that's going to be the main aspect that I'm going to be trying to focus on while that's something I feel my best for because racing and freestyle, that stuff never has to stop at any point. Um, whereas waterfalls, I think now is the time to, to be doing the, pursuing those the most. Awesome. Cool. So I'm going to move on to uh, the next segment of our show that I, that I call the fire round. Um, Dane, do you have a favorite quote that you live by? Uh, not necessarily um i uh i just don't uh i think there's just a lot of a lot of things i feel like um uh what was it i feel like it was one quote that i always kind of remembered i'm trying to remember what it was though kind of ironic um but it was uh who had it was like who had the better life the one who braved the storms of the seas and survived or the one that stayed on the shore and merely existed um and i thought that kind of sums up the action sport athlete lifestyle a little bit Cool. No, that, that makes perfect sense in, in my eyes for sure. Um, I know we've kind of talked about this, you know, offline before, but do you have a, a favorite book or podcast or just anything that you, you know, have read or listened to that kind of uh, inspires you along the way? Uh, I've never been much of a kind of get into podcasts, but I've never been much of a book person. Um, I uh, pretty much only started listening to books like this year, last year. Um, I mean, I love Alchemist. Like, I think that that was another book that uh, um, I'm listening to again right now, actually. But I was, uh, that was like basically one of the first books I listened to because I only read kind of a little bit of books when I was a kid. But I like, never been baiting and reading, and I still don't necessarily like reading books. But I like listening to books on tape when either working out or long drive. Um, but I love The Alchemist because I think that book kind of sums up what we do in a really good way. Uh, no, I love The Alchemist as well. It's actually one of my most favorite books. Um, and I've always found it kind of interesting. I mean, I know that you're not a huge reader and partly why I asked the question anyway, but I, I find it funny that for someone who doesn't read that much, you, I mean, the, the listeners out here probably don't know this, but you're like one of the best spellers that I've ever met. Like you just know all the words out there and like, no matter what the vocabulary, you like pretty much know how to spell everything, which I always find very intriguing for, for someone who doesn't uh, read that much. And actually, I mean, just on the top of it, while I'm just thinking about it, I guess it, it kind of maybe comes back to the fact that I feel like you've got 
a bit of a photographic memory, um, which I think, you know, helps a lot with running rapids and just like having smooth lines, knowing what's kind of coming. Do you feel that? Or is that just like something that I've probably just told you over the years? Uh, no, I, I definitely, I don't know what other people are able to do, but I definitely know that growing up, um, like I could show up to a river I've seen a bunch and know exactly what rapids coming up just from watching footage. Um, even before there were GoPros, I could still like, I could be like, oh yeah, this is this rapid or that rapid. But also uh, I can definitely, I can run a river and maybe not like the second leading up, but as soon as I like get close enough to a rapid or um, even if I ran it the first time the day before, I could take a group down the next day. Um, Cause as long as long, it might take me a second, but I will be able to figure out what the rapid is. Um, whether it's a, a creek or big water, whatever it is. So I definitely, I find, uh, I do, I don't know, photographic memory is the word for it, but I definitely feel really good that like, I just, all it takes is one lap and I'll go the next day and it's like, I've known it for years. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's, for me, that's why I'm usually so comfortable following you because I know that you've got a really good idea of what we're coming into or what the, what the line is and all that kind of stuff. So Dane, growing up in the sport, I mean, you've been surrounded by so many people and top athletes. I mean, obviously your, your dad as well. Um, who would be some of, you know, your mentors or people that you look up to the most, uh, within the sport? I mean, obviously there's always my dad there and, and people that have been my life from the beginning or whether it came in later, like, uh, it's hard to really like, I mean, everybody had their, uh, kind of their input or their, their voice of reason, whether in almost every aspect, whether it's freestyle, safety, waterfall, whatever it is, there is, there are thousands of people that I've gotten to see and people, a lot of people are still that were there when I first learned that are still around today. Like, like I would probably not be half as safe on the river when it comes to, uh, remembering always have a rope or always have an extra rope to give someone else safety kit where to get out and scout if I didn't grow up with clay you know like clay was clay taught like I learned from a lot of other people as well but clay was like this thick way like stick to this even as a kid he's like would get upset if I did something wrong or maybe hey I forgot uh, my rope in the car or something and maybe that didn't seem like a big deal as a kid but you would get really upset and and not very stoked and then now I'm like oh yeah of course I'm so glad that he was taught me all the things instead of just being like oh whatever the kid forgot the rope he was like no you need this and now i always make sure i have a rope i always am the one that gets out and scouts i don't like running into things blind uh unless i feel really good about what i'm seeing or even if it's one person scout so i mean like someone like clay was the voice of reason for safety and there's i had all these other people that helped me with every other aspect so i think it's really hard to just name a few because everyone had some form of whether i got to learn from them or just watch them awesome it's it's almost like the the kayaking community as a whole is like, there's that saying it takes a, a village to raise a child or something like that. It's like the whole kayaking community was your village to, to raise you into yeah. who you are. Super cool. Yeah. yeah luckily people were just willing to put up with me like you. <laughs> <laughs> if I, I love that. If you could go back in time uh, to any time period and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, uh, probably. I don't know. I, I, it's hard to say. I feel like I, I think the only thing I would say that I've learned a lot more as I've gotten older is that, um, and I don't, I don't dwell on things very much, but like uh, back when I was like first becoming good and competing and stuff, uh, those like first like big losses, like whether it was like not winning like the 2007 world or we're getting knocked down 2005 world, things like that, or maybe a bad result or maybe just not as clean of a line as I wanted. Um, reminding myself that it's actually not as big of a deal as you think you're going to forget about it like really quick like everyone will forget you're going to forget you're going to move on there's next like there's, there's always next year was always such an annoying thing to hear as a as a kid but luckily over the years i've definitely learned that it's a bummer but life will continue and pe people often forget even if you win people forget so i think the biggest advice was win or loss things are going to continue on and got to keep doing other things as well i love that and i love that 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 you know works for kayaking, but that, that really, you can take that and extrapolate that into any aspect of life. Do you know what I mean? Like win or loss, like just keep moving on. Like tomorrow's another day type thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Dane, what would you consider one of your most awesome experiences within the sport of kayaking? Um, uh, I, uh, I don't know. It's hard to, I can't really put a, a finger on that. I mean, I, 
every every river or every experience had something you know that was cool or memorable in some way whether it was uh you know just getting to see some incredible new place successfully running a, a huge waterfall or just the people you get to hang out with even just the people you kayak with on some of the easiest white water is still some of the most memorable stuff so it's, it's really hard to to pick a favorite because everything is was special in some way and um yeah i i don't know it's really I can't really put my finger on it because there's just a it's been a lifetime of a lot of incredible things and looking forward to a lot more. That's awesome. Um, if you were to leave this earth today, so today is your last day and everything. Today's not good. Can we do Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> but if everything was to disappear, everything that you've done, all the, you know, all the records, all your videos, um, you know, photos, everything that you've done up to, up to now is gone. And all that you were left uh, to, you know, pass on was a piece of paper and you were able to leave three things that you thought were to be true. What would your three truths be? Like yeah. advice? Yeah. Like, yeah. Just like advice or just something that you would want to like, you know, leave as, as your kind of ending, you know, message to the world or whatever, or to yourself, to like other kids that are coming up in the sport, anything just if, if you had nothing else to, to leave this earth with other than three things left on a piece of paper. Um, well, the little heads up on uh, this question before it would have been nice. Um, uh, I didn't know we were going deep. Um, uh, I'd probably put it was worth it. Uh, thanks to everyone that was a part. And stay stoked. I love it. No, I mean, it really is. That, that's perfect message. And, and I love the, that you say it's worth it because it totally is. I mean, every day is, is a journey on its own and is magical in its own way. And so, um, I love that. It's, it's worth it. Stay stoked. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Dane, San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, and for anybody out there that wants to, you know, connect with you, send you a message, um, uh, follow you along the way, what's the best place, uh, or way for someone to connect with you? Tinder. No, um, no, that was a joke. I don't actually have Tinder. Um, uh, obviously, I'm on the usual places. I'm never on Facebook, so it's Instagram um, is the best spot, but uh, I'm also on YouTube a lot. So basically, YouTube and Instagram, that's where you'll find me. Always down to give advice, chat, answer any questions. I'm around. Cool. And for anybody out there who doesn't already know, Dane's Instagram is just Dane Jackson Kayak. So go check him out on Instagram and I think your your YouTube is just Dane Jackson. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you'll find me on there. You start Dane Jackson, I'll be there. There's a lot of videos there. Awesome. So, yeah, everybody out there, uh, go give Dane a follow on Instagram and check him out on YouTube. Uh, Dane, thank you so much for joining us. This has just been awesome. I uh, loved hearing where you think the sport's going and just kind of a little bit about your journey as well. So thank you. And for all of our listeners out there, thank you guys for listening, for staying tuned. If you got any value out of this, uh, please share it with uh, friends, family, or just throw it up on your social media as we're trying to build our community and collective as a whole and just trying to uh, spread the word and share the love. So thank you guys for listening. I'm Nick Troutman signing off and wishing you all an awesome day. Cheers.